I'm Alan Coates. I want to welcome back to our microphones, Alex Jones, talk show host, documentary filmmaker. We didn't have to send a car, Alex, so I guess there was no mix-up, right? No, there wasn't. I can't believe there were hundreds of news articles, and the, and the five on Fox covered it, that, that I supposedly wouldn't show up to a This Week with George Stephanopoulos. I mean, I wish I would have been there. They never completed setting up the interview. They first said that it was going to be live and promised, so I couldn't be edited. Then they said, no, it's not live. Then they kept changing the time, and I didn't hear from them for a day, so it didn't happen. Then 12 minutes before airtime, they call me and say, there's a car waiting outside for you. Well, I was literally in a robe cook cooking my kids breakfast, so I didn't go. Well, you know, you're the kind of guy, you'll get more press out of not doing an interview than some people get for doing them. <laughs> you know it's I mean? just bizarre. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, exactly. But I've, as you know, I've always shown up for your show. Very honored to be here. No, look, I've, I appreciate I've that. And I've been you. pretty. I've been on everything. And I've been pretty critical of you, so I appreciate you coming on the program. We've oh, had. I a, don't mind that. That's fine. You know, and I, you know, because some of the stuff you say and do, I think it, it's it's instills such fear into people, Alex. And I think you're great at what you do. You've developed an incredible following. Uh, you've really built it up from grassroots, starting with the Internet, developing radio affiliates. It's a great accomplishment in a very tough business. But you scare people, don't you? Well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I think we have a problem of not being concerned enough about serious problems in our society. We've gotten kind of a normalcy bias, Alan. And so I think it's good. I'm personally concerned. And so, yes, I think some of that, uh, you call it fear if you want, telegraphs through. But it's like, it's like waking up at night, 2 a.m., smelling smoke, and getting your kids up and getting them out of the house. You're not living in fear. You're getting out of the house because it's on fire. Or if your neighbor's house is on fire, getting uh, you know, uh, out of your house and going and knocking on their door. Look, they're acting like and misrepresenting that I said the military was going to take over this summer and that we'd have martial law and that it was all about Obama. What I really said was, since the days of Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1961, his farewell address about beware the undue influence of military-industrial complex, whether sought or unsought, because the, the, the danger exists and will persist of this disastrous rise. And I've quoted that over and over again. That was my plan to go on other shows, you know, like this week, and just quote Eisenhower verbatim. And then the media, the controlled media, mainly a lot of the right-wing controlled media, but also some of the left wing, gets up and says, he hates the military, and he <laughs> says they're coming for the guns this summer. No, that's not what I said. I said, this is part of a continuation of the militarization of police, the MRAPs being delivered, uh, the, the fake drug war, the asset forfeiture seizure, uh, the IRS taking you know old people's uh, bank accounts for no reason. This is all over the news. It's bipartisan tyranny. And sure, the media thinks I'm a good target to discredit any anti-police state movement that's bipartisan by trying to attach me to it, who comes off as sensational. But the truth is, Alan, reality reality is sensational, and the very Democrats that praised me for exposing George Bush's police state. I mean, I used to come on your show. Yep. You were still critical of me on 9-11 and stuff, but you'd say, yo, you're right about this and that. I would come on your show 10 years ago and talk about NSA spying. You would agree. You knew it was going on right. when Bush was doing it. And, and, and the Democrats were praising me. Now I talk about Obama continuing it, and I'm a right-wing extremist. It's pure bull. Well, look, I've been critical of Obama for doing it. I've been critical of Obama for going back into Afghanistan, a surge in Afghanistan, going back into Iraq, going into Libya. So we agree on some of that stuff. But when you say, for example, do you believe, well, it's actually, I should ask this in the form of a question, do you believe that Jade Helm is the first step toward martial law in this country? Yes, I think that the MRAPs, the checkpoints, the military drills, Alan, I aired a clip today on my show. I aired a clip yesterday. New clips every two or three days, but lately it's every day, of Marines, Army, and National Guard training for civil unrest in America and basically taking over local government. I mean, this is ramping up massively. And I think when we have the TSA uh, groping people, I think when we have NSA spying, I think when we have the IRS and, and police and DEA, you know, taking money off people on trains, you know, that's legal money, I think that's a form of soft martial law. And so I think it's the frog in the pot scenario of, I don't think we're in total martial law. I don't think it's ever coming that it's going to be pure Hitlerian martial law. But I think incrementally we're going into a post-free America scenario. But you don't see that Jade Helm is a military exercise simply because parts of this country 
have the same terrain as other parts. Look, I'm against these wars as much as you are. But to train for these wars, uh, they are trying to find, replicate terrain they would use or need no. to combat in those wars. No. And that is no. why they're doing Jane Helm. No. Uh, l listen, I'm an expert on this. I've made four films on the police state, uh, you know, when Bush was in. And I've been to the drills. I've been to the urban warfare drills. I have the footage where they're training. I mean, just last year, we published an article titled, Army Prepares to Intern Blacks. Clearly seeing that there was a move towards that. And then now you see all the stuff that's happening now because we had the internal footage at these big military training facilities where all the role players were black and they were shouting basically pro-black slogans and being rounded up by the army. Uh, we have the video, Alan, of the new footage where they say, I'm a sovereign citizen or I'm a gun owner, I'm a veteran. Uh, you can't put me in a FEMA camp and the, and the Marines charge and tackle them or, or the National Guard does. Listen, on The Daily Show last week, very funny show, like the show, John Stewart, plays your know, clips, makes fun of us, and then shows a clip from 10 years ago where they were having a drill in Texas. But the drill was in Fort Bliss in the desert, and they were training to take out Iraqi tanks, and it was helicopters against tanks. This is not helicopters against tanks. Of course, most military training is legitimate. This, and as you said, the war wasn't legitimate, but it was legitimate offshore, you know, overseas yeah. training. This is not this is not Apaches practicing to blow up uh, Russian tanks that the Iraqis have. This is training for domestic operations. I mean, it's in the Associated Press. It's in the New York Times. So, what do you it's think, Jade Helm? What do you training. think the goal is? The goal is to acclimate the military, who are good people, good men and women, and the police and the locals, just to accept this militarized culture. Uh, this this police state culture all around us. And again, it's, I'm not even against the police. I'm against the corporate directorship of like the Rand Corporation that 20 years ago wrote the National Stabilization Police Force Plan that we're implementing under NORTHCOM that, that militarizes our police and that merges them under the Defense Department. And then, you know, Rick Perry says, you can criticize the government, but not our military. Our military is under the command of special interest in our government. So this is, it's Jade Helm is about militarizing, militarizing the police. Uh, it's about, a, is it about a government or military takeover of Texas? No, it simply gets everybody used to seeing a state listed as hostile to begin to introduce that. I don't think it's a takeover this summer. I think it's all part of a conditioning process. And I've talked to people at CENTCOM and SOUTHCOM that are involved in this. They say, yes, that is what it is. And then we have, Alan, literally, and you're a news hound. You've seen all these articles. Uh, your listeners can Google them. Hundreds of mainstream articles admitting that the military is being trained to, quote, crush a Tea Party rebellion or, quote, infiltrate animal rights groups or, quote, infiltrate anti-war groups. I mean, that was in Michael Moore's Fahrenheit. And you think that's what Jade Helm was about, training the military to infiltrate certain groups they find undesirable in the United States? The actual Jade Helm document. Listen, when this broke back in March... We were just covering a regular story about wonder if this is for martial law down the road, another conditioning drill. Joe Biggs, military vet, brought me the document, Army.mil. And, you know, the, the, the media kind of edited out of context to make it sound alarmist, uh, playing five-second clips. Then the media all freaked out about it, but the document says that the military will simulate illegal activities in cities with police out of uniform. And, and, and yes, that's exactly what it is. Listen. Go back to the Associated Press, 1999. In San Antonio, the Delta Force, uh, look it up, got caught paying off local officials to be part of drills that the city council had voted down. So this is what brings down third world countries. This is what brings down other nations. This is what Caesar did when he brought his legions south of the Rubicon. It, it, it's the bane of every civilization to have bad political interests be left or right, take control of the military, and use it to take over. Adolf Hitler did it. He got elected in 33. Within a year, he used the military to basically take over. Are you comparing the United States to pre-Nazi Germany? Do you believe that we are in the... In the Absolutely. 
absolutely. Most professors, left or right, say that we are headed towards a tyranny. We are eroding our freedoms. I mean, our spying is beyond Nazi Germany. But how do you anticipate that happening in a country where we have free elections, we have primaries, we have a process in place? How out of that, out of this process, this democratic or representative democratic process, do you see a Hitler or a Nazi Germany type country well, arise? Let's be clear. I don't think we're going to have a clown with a mustache. Uh, invading Poland or invading Czechoslovakia or Danzig or, 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 or Austria. It's more of the special interests that only care about their interest and aren't even thinking about how the dominoes fall and what type of crisis can come out of that. And I don't think it's going to happen because I'm going to speak out against it so it doesn't happen. This is the give and take of good versus evil. This is why we need to be eternally vigilant and not trust our government, because not the government's bad, but the bad special interests throughout history seek to use the power of government to expand their compass of control. I want to take a quick break. We'll be back with Alex Jones in just a moment. Our lines are open at 877-367-2526. I'm Alan Combs, Alex Jones, the documentary filmmaker, talk show host, multimedia. What's your take, Alex, on uh, what happened with Amtrak in Philadelphia two days ago? Well, you know, my, uh, my family, at least previously, they're all dead now, but my grandparents and folks were all involved working for the railroad. And they were complaining when I was a kid about the fact they were never upgrading the railways and the rail beds. And I don't know about this particular case. It's still up in the air. I don't know if the engineer was at fault or whatever. They say it was going too fast. I'm going to wait till the investigation comes out. But I know this. We have some of the most crumbling infrastructure in the world, and our railways are the worst. Most third world countries have better rail beds and, and, and rails than we have. They've not been updated more than 50 years. And we're just going to see more and more of this. And statistically, it's happening uh, because we've not invested in our infrastructure. It's true. Uh, and those who say this are accused of politicizing it. But that really is the problem. Whether or not it was a mechanical issue, a personal issue, I mean, an a engineer, a human issue, or whether or not couldn't, couldn't we have, for example, on a curve like that where you can't go more than 50 miles an hour, an automatic piece of equipment that would force a train to slow down so this doesn't even happen. That that technology is available. But, I mean, expanding on that, my grandmother, when she was getting her master's degree in education, when my dad was five years old, would go to the train station five miles from her house, six miles from her house, and get on a bullet train that went 110 miles an hour to Houston, 150 miles away. And it took like an hour to get there, and then she'd be back by dinner. Uh, now that very same train line, that the, the freight on it can't go over 45 miles an hour, and there are no passenger trains. So how in 19, you know, 1950, how was my grandmother going to Houston on a bullet train, like something out of the you know, old Superman shows, a you know, big black train? How can we not have that when I'm, I've been to Europe and, and the trains go 220 miles an hour, uh, Alan? Why do you think that is? Why are we so far behind the curve? Well, I'm a big fan of cars. But I'm also for balance. And let's just be honest. Uh, the auto industry in the 30s, 40s, and 50s lobbied to shut down everything from trolley cars to light rail to the big trains. And uh, now we're so far behind, I don't even know we can ever even have trains. And usually they're a boondoggle when they try to build them. So, I mean, it's just kind of damn we do, damn we don't. But we just do not have a train culture anymore in this country, even though it's what built much of this nation. And you said the audio in the auto industry is behind that? Oh, it's, there's been films made, books written uh, about the auto industry lobbying to kill uh, the trolley cars in San Francisco, the trolley cars in New York, the trolley cars uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, and to basically make it all go to cars so that we wouldn't you know, have competition to the auto industry. Absolutely. That's established. I mean, that's, that's crony capitalism, where instead of automobiles competing with trains, the automobile industry just killed trains. Let us go to uh, Scott in Ithaca with uh, with Alex Jones. Hello, Scott. Go ahead. I'm just laughing at what you said because I you know I tuned in at a certain point and you know he said that you don't agree with Alex and I'm I'm you know you know I'm a progressive lefty uh, Democrat but uh, 
so far, everything that he said is like kind of spot well, on. Well, there, there, Alex and I do have areas of commonality. In fact, many times, as Alex pointed out, during the Bush years, Alex would come on this show and talk about some of the terrible things and and lack of civil liberties we were experiencing during those days. So, uh, right, you know, right. there's lots of uh, commonality in spite of our disagreements. Right. I just think my comment is, I think this is going to be the worst election cycle in the history of the United States, and I mean on both sides, the amount of money that's behind, the amount of dirty money that actually has, that Hillary used when she was trying to be senator, and you can, you can agree or disagree. I mean, there are some films that have been made about it, and some of it's, like, hor- horrific, actually. On both sides, the money is just deplorable, right. and until we actually get a new Supreme Court... Well, that's why we had Bernie Sanders um, on before, who, you know, he's the guy who doesn't uh, take PAC money, and he's the guy who's pure on this stuff, but he's probably not going to get yeah. elected. I mean, it's if, what But you keep yeah. saying that, but if Bernie, if Bernie appoints, if he has the ability, that if he goes far enough and he appoints Elizabeth Warren as a VP... They will win. Well, you'd have to get the nomination first. All right, thank you for the call. Who do you like for president, Alex? Well, on the libertarian uh, patriot side, I like Rand Paul. If I had to go for a Democrat, I would like Elizabeth Warren or Mr. Sanders. Not that I agree with some right. of what they say. Doesn't Rand Paul, though, moved away from his libertarian roots to some extent in order to appeal to a broader Republican constituency? He has absolutely uh, moved about 50 degrees away from where he was. Uh, for for political reasons, but I know him personally. I know he's a good guy, uh, and you know overall, I agree with his economic policies and a lot of other issues and cutting off. So you uh, think he's just aid. saying what he needs to say to get the nomination, which is unlikely as it is, at least according to according according to current polls, and that given his druthers, he would revert to the Rand Paul we thought we were getting when we elected him. I mean, Kentucky did anyway. You know, I'll say this. I think I think a lot of his moderation is up there being able to, you know, basically try to work with people and he gets that he wants to get some of what he wants instead of none of what he wants. Uh, so I don't think I can speak for him and say that, you know, he's purely engaging in political manipulation. Uh, I think that some of his advisors have had him move too far towards the center because the center when the Republicans and Democrats are basically the same except for rhetoric, well, the center is basically the same place. So, I mean, just like I just said, I like an Elizabeth Warren or a, or a Bernie Sanders over Hillary, it's the same reason I like a Rand Paul. At least they are outsiders comparatively. It doesn't mean any of them are perfect. Isn't someone like uh, Gary but, Johnson much more of a pure libertarian? Yeah, I mean, I think Gary Johnson is a pure libertarian. I'm friends with him. I've interviewed him many times. We've you know, hung out, and I, and I think he's a really good, legitimate guy. The problem is is that, you know, he's almost, uh, I don't want to be mean, but he's almost Asperger-ish or, or, or autistic when it comes to just how dry he is. So he's not exciting, but he, you know, he's, he's smart, he's the, he's the real deal, he's been a governor, he knows how to run things. He's been a bit successful oh, I, businessman. I think he'd make a great president. I mean, don't get yeah. me wrong. I mean, look, 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 I come off as too wild, but people, you know, like it because it's real. I'm just saying he's too dry. I've told him, you need, you need to, you need to get excited. I mean, that's what he needs to do. I mean, but Rand Paul comes off as pretty dry as well, uh, but he's, he's, I don't want to call him slick. He's yeah. not like Bill Clinton. I'll tell you, slick is Ted Cruz. I mean, Ted Cruz, um, Ted Cruz, overall, is a really interesting candidate. The problem is he's counsel on foreign relations. His right. wife works for Goldman Sachs. And I'm not just saying, you know, he, he's Got a bad it. person. I tell you, I'm, bad. I'm up against a hard... But hold on just one second. We'll come right back with Alex Jones in just a moment. We're at 877-4-ALLEN. All right, we're talking to Alex Jones. Alex Jones, the uh, famous talk show host, documentary filmmaker. Um, and uh, we've moved Alex to his cell because he's on his way to pick up his kids. So there might be a little background noise. you got to do what you got to do as a dad there, right, Alex? Absolutely, right. Alan. Good to be here with you. All right, let us uh, go to our phones here. Uh, take some more calls here for Alex Jones and uh, Stewart in Alberta. I know Stewart's a big Alex fan, and Stewart would call me up and say, "Why do you have an Alex Jones on?" So today, Stewart, here it is. Oh yeah, I called in today to call you out, Alan, because I didn't think you were going to have Alex on today. So I'll give you <laughs> the award for being First Amendment champ of the day for sure. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, that's awesome. Hey, uh, Alex. Uh, yeah, of course, I'm a big fan. I tune in uh, quite regularly. Uh, I wanted you to touch base with Alan's audience because a lot of people are having trouble connecting the dots. And uh, like and just when it comes to tyranny in general. Um, but I wanted you to touch base a little bit on Stalin 
and his fluorination program, Hitler and his fluorination program, uh, and then, oddly enough, after that, every American city and their fluorination programs. I want you to talk a little bit about vaccines and glyphosate. And by the time it'll be midnight by the time we're done, uh, well, Stuart, I got to get, I got to narrow this down here. Uh, yeah, but just, just to generally, the general yeah. soft wep- uh, silent sure. weapon for yeah. silent war. Okay, all right, thanks, sir. Thanks, thank you very yeah. much. All right, go ahead, Alex. You, you want to respond? Well, uh, I mean, I mean, it really is true that it's in mainline World War II books that Hitler learned from Stalin back when they were uh, allied uh, before they, uh, you know, sort of fight each other over Poland, that they would put high levels of hydrofluorosilicic acid, a particular type of fluoride, in the water to make the uh, people docile. And Harvard came out two years ago. I know that Stanley Kubrick makes fun of it in his film, um, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Strangelove, but, but for real. That particular type of fluoride is very toxic. It actually makes people very, very passive. It's the main uh, ingredient in Prozac. And just this year, the federal government, under pressure from its own scientists, banned fluoride in pesticides. It's one of the main pesticide ingredients. And it just cut the amount from 1.6 parts per million in water to uh, 0.7 parts per million, uh, citing dental fluorosis and bone fractures and cancer. So it turns out the federal government agrees with the kooks that uh, too much fluoride is bad for you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the call. Um, do you think the federal government is behind putting stuff in into our system for the purpose of pacifying us? Not the federal government, but eugenicists that were part of the Nuremberg trials and learned about the Nazis doing this. It's in the, it's in the Nuremberg trials. And they thought, what a great idea. And John P. Holdren, the White House science czar, wrote uh, in his 1974 book, Eco-Science, about putting chemicals in the water to make the public docile. And you believe that's what's going on. But who's, so who's doing this? You said the federal government's not doing it. Who is? Well, no. Good scientists in the federal government, just like good scientists in the 30s said, put iodine in the salt which is a good halogen. Uh, fluoride's a bad halogen, on average. There's different variants. You need calcium fluoride. Uh, then, then bad, a eugenics cult that went underground after World War II basically took over part of the federal government and the federal health department, Department of Health and Human Services, basically, and has been using it as a eugenics operation partially through different factions uh, ever since. I so mean, that, there, that, so that, there's basically a cabal in these departments... That is looking to what um, kind of um, calm us down, give us a certain. Uh, they're purposely trying to control us by doing this. Well, the, I mean, the White House science wrote a book about it. Yeah, it's eleven hundred pages long, uh, and, and and his policy got adopted as official policy, basically. And, and it's all compartmentalized. Look, I'm not the one that wrote all this. It sounds crazy. I agree with you. It's it's real. I mean, Alan. You can Google right now, ABC News, London Guardian. They just cut the fluoride in the water by more than half, uh, Alan. They just banned it and, and pesticide, Alan. And that's because good scientists in the government have been battling it for 20 years. And, you know, I know Stanley Kubrick's daughter, uh, his protege, and, and she said that, you know, before her dad died, uh, he figured out that fluoride was bad. Uh, we go to Mark in Amarillo, Texas with Alex Jones. Hello, Mark. Yeah, hi, yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you, Alan, for having this great patriot on your show, okay? Most the, most uh, of the uh, talk radio mafia wouldn't dare. Uh, well, I'm not I part of the all. mafia, so it's... A <laughs> well, I guess not. not part of the okay. talk radio mafia. I'm not in the in-group, but go ahead. You know, there is a literal... I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I wanted to talk, thank you, sir, but you know there is a literal uh, Rush Limbaugh mafia where the big five hosts uh, all are managed by Rush Limbaugh's brother, Uh so, so yes, there is actually a, 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 a media mafia. Sorry. Yeah, okay. But anyway, Alex, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, one about Boston. I've been, you know, on the Internet, and uh, you know John B. Wells, right? I mean, he used to be in Coast to Coast. I know he's been in your yeah. show. Yeah, you guys work together and all that. Uh, he's had people on that show. Well, first of all, he's had Wolfgang Halbig on a number of times. And Wolfgang just recently had a hearing in uh, Connecticut. Uh, and to, to prove that Sandy Hook was a hoax. And also, there seems to be evidence that Boston was a hoax because the thing that 
was brought out, all the evidence brought out, showed that it looks like it may have been actors, it may have been fake blood. Do you believe that, Alex, have... that uh, the Boston Marathon bombing was a hoax? Well, we can spend five hours on this. Uh, I don't... Th there is a camp of people who think it was all completely fake. Do you, uh, but do you believe I, that? Well, I, mean, I want to be specific. I don't believe we were given the entire story. I don't think that the living Boston bomber, a uh, convicted suspect, acted alone. I know his brother was on a State Department program that the Russians blew the cover on two years before the Boston bombing that he was actually CIA. You can actually well, look that up, mainstream news. And and there was a drill of a bombing that day. Um, I don't know. Who See, do you think, then, was behind the bombing? Uh, I'm going to tell you, Alan, and I'm not passing the buck. I don't know. It needs to be uh, investigated uh, because there was a drill that day. It was on Boston Radio and the Boston So Globe. you don't believe it was two brothers acting alone? Uh, I mean, they executed the older brother, uh, Tamerlan, uh, and claimed he killed a cop and all this stuff. And no, that was true. They then shot up the boat the younger brother, Zarnev, was hiding in. Uh, and then his lawyer came out and said, it doesn't matter if he says not guilty, he's guilty. When your lawyer says you're guilty, there's a setup going on. So and then they're going to put him in a supermax prison. They're going to put him in a supermax prison, and he's never going to be heard from again. You know they put people in supermaxes, so the real story doesn't But who do you think now. is behind all this? I told you, I don't know, but the official story is full of Swiss cheese holes. Okay, there's more to that than that. Uh, I, there's also the, the one guy, that one Russian guy or uh, you know Chechen guy was murdered in cold blood by the FBI down in Florida. And listen to this. That's true. That's very true. suspicious about the FBI agent. I looked it up. Actually, I found it first in the, on InfoWars, and I looked it up on the Boston Globe. This guy had been actually, he wasn't fired. He was let go from the, Boston, from the Oakland Police Department for corruption, but evidently they couldn't prove what they wanted to prove. They're probably afraid he'd bring back, so they gave him some kind of a, I don't know, BS uh, disability. I know, yeah. That's, that's and true. then the FBI hires him. Now, you tell me that's not suspicious, and then they send him down. Also, the Boston office of the FBI has been dirty for a long time since Whitey Bulger, okay? Yeah, yeah well, let's go. Well, well, sure, sure, let's go further. Yeah, now, Whitey Bulger was an FBI front for them to run organized mm -hmm. crime, at least in that area. I agree. That's what I'm saying. Criminal sectors of government, not the whole government. You're absolutely right. The, right. FBI, first said, the FBI first said he attacked him. Then they admitted he was handcuffed when they shot him in the back of the head. I, I, absolutely true. We thank uh, Mark for the call. Alex, where do you go to get your information? What do you read every day? Well, people say that I say I don't believe mainstream media. That's not true. Most mainstream media is just dry reporting. And I don't go off one report, but I'll go off 10 or 15 that basically are reporting something that witnesses saw. So most of the time I go off mainstream media. I go off uh, documents, legislation, uh, trade publications are very well, What mainstream media? Where do you start, though? Where do you go? Where, where do you start? Well, well, well I, mean, I, mean, I mean, here's where I'm going. When there's major pundits, whether it be Fox or CNN or MSNBC, with an official political message... You can believe it's tainted, twisted, or spun. It's local news that just reports dryly what they saw that doesn't get a lot of attention that I found to be very, very accurate, probably 90%. You know, and they're not trying to lie. It's just stuff's complex. You get stuff wrong. I get stuff wrong. So I look at alternative media, mainstream media, local media, uh, government documents, eyewitnesses, and generally that is 150 degrees, not 180 Different than the official. I mean, it's kind of like everybody knows Saddam's got WMDs, uh, you know, New York Times and George Bush say, well, it was all lies. Uh, but, but see, it wasn't that the New York Times always lies. They tell the truth about what movie's good, what restaurant's good, what happened in Serbia today most of the time. But when it's a key lie, they use the credibility to then float the BS. And that's what you then target and expose. Then they say, oh, you don't believe the mainstream media, but yeah. you use it. No, 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 no. I use the big body of reportage, but I can tell PR spin and when something's being pushed. I can tell when somebody is basically, for lack of a better word, 
uh, you know, one against the wind. I mean, you can right. see when they're pushing. So it where do you go? Where, what alternative media do you then go to? You know, I don't even so much go to media. It's like Marco Rubio, the senator, comes out and says the NSA listens to no one domestically. Well, the head of the NSA has now admitted they are. So it is a 100% fraudulent, disgusting, flaming lie. And I just play the clip of where he says that that's happening, that, that, you know, that, you know, that nothing's being spied on. It's like saying the sun didn't come up this morning. And then I show 15 mainstream news articles with government officials admitting they're spying on the American people. Problems in our society, we've gotten kind of a normalcy bias, Alan. And so I think it's good. I'm personally concerned. And so, yes, I think some of that, uh, you call it fear if you want, telegraphs through. But it's like, it's like waking up at night, 2 a.m., smelling smoke, and getting your kids up and getting them out of the house. You're not living in fear. You're getting out of the house because it's on fire. Or if your neighbor's house is on fire, getting uh, you know uh, out of your house and going and knocking on their door. Look, they're acting like and misrepresenting that I said the military was going to take over this summer and that we'd have martial law and that it was all about Obama. What I really said was, since the days of Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1961, his farewell address about beware the undue influence of the military-industrial complex, whether sought or to discredit any anti-police state movement that's bipartisan by trying to attach me to it, who comes off as sensational. But the truth is, Alan, reality is sensational, and the very Democrats that praised me for exposing George Bush's police state. I mean, I used to come on your show. Yep. You were still critical of me on 9-11 and stuff, but you'd say, yo, you're right about this and that. I would come on your show 10 years ago and talk about NSA spying. You would agree. You knew it was going on right. when Bush was doing it. And, and, and the Democrats were praising me. Now I talk about Obama continuing it, and I'm a right-wing extremist. It's pure bull. Well, look, I've been critical of Obama for doing it. I've been critical of Obama for going back into Afghanistan, or surge in Afghanistan, going back into Iraq, going into Libya. So we agree on some of that stuff. But when you say, for example, do you believe... Unsought, because the, the, the danger exists and will persist of this disastrous rise. And I've quoted that over and over again. That was my plan to go on other shows, you know, like this week, and just quote Eisenhower verbatim. And then the media, the controlled media, mainly a lot of the right-wing controlled media, but also some of the left-wing, gets up and says, he hates the military, and he <laughs> says they're coming for the guns this summer. No, that's not what I said. I said... This is part of a continuation of the militarization of police, the MRAPs being delivered, uh, the, the fake drug war, the asset forfeiture seizure, uh, the IRS taking you know old people's uh, bank accounts for no reason. This is all over the news. It's bipartisan tyranny. And sure, the media thinks I'm a good target, so I didn't go. Well, you know, you're the kind of guy, you'll get more press out of not doing an interview than some people get for doing them. <laughs> you know it's I mean? just bizarre. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, exactly. But I've, as you know, I've always shown up for your show. Very honored to be here. No, look, I, I appreciate that. And I've been you. pretty I've been on everything. And I've been pretty critical of you, so I appreciate you coming on the program. We've oh, had. I a, don't mind that. That's fine. You know, and I. You know, because some of the stuff you say and do, I think it, it's it's instills such fear into people, Alex. And I think you're great at what you do. You've developed an incredible following. Uh, you've really built it up from grassroots, starting with the Internet, developing radio affiliates. It's a great accomplishment in a very tough business. But you scare people, don't you? Well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I think we have a problem of not being concerned enough about serious problems. I'm Alan Coates. I want to welcome back to our microphones Alex Jones, talk show host, documentary filmmaker. We didn't have to send a car, Alex, so I guess there was no mix-up, right? No, there wasn't. I can't believe there were hundreds of news articles, and the and the five on Fox covered it. That that I supposedly wouldn't show up to a this week with George Stephanopoulos. I mean, I wish I would have been there. They never completed setting up the interview. They first said that it was going to be live and promised, so I couldn't be edited. Then they said no, it's not live. Then they kept changing the time, and I didn't hear from them for a day, so it didn't happen. Then twelve minutes before airtime. They call me and say, there's a car waiting outside for you. Well, I was literally in a robe cooking my kids breakfast.